geologically, I would say that sometime in the next decade, we should start to see uh, a decline in world, well, we've already seen a decline in world production, but it's, uh, we, we should start to see, you know, what people would call peak oil begin in earnest. Now, the it's not going to be a collapse, okay? <laughs> Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. If you're watching this, whether you're a fan of fossil fuels or not, there's no denying that modern society is still immensely dependent on them, particularly oil. Look around you. Practically everything you see required oil somewhere along the process of being mined, manufactured, or transported to get to where you are, even the food you ate today. Oil is still the lifeblood of the global economy, yet after hitting $120 a barrel a year ago, its price has since dropped nearly in half. For an update on what lies ahead with this essential fuel, as well as the global energy markets in general, we welcome petroleum geologist and energy industry analyst Art Berman back to the program. Art, it's a pleasure as always to see you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Likewise, Adam. It's great to be here with you. Um, Art, it's just, it's, Super fun to have you on this program. I've had a lot of people um, of late asking for an update on oil. So I know a lot of people have been um, really looking forward to this conversation. Um, I, I gave a nod to this in the introduction, but just quickly, as a just a quick grounding for those haven't, who haven't watched our previous videos together in the past, can you just comment on how important oil remains to the global economy? Sure. Um, it's, you know, something like, uh, 75% of the world's primary energy use. Um, and the headlines, of course, are you know full of renewable this and solar that and hydrogen and all kinds of stuff. And I follow all that as carefully as I do oil. I spent my life in oil, so I'm not going to claim to be uh, as much of an expert on that other kind of energy as, as I am oil. But I'm, I'm, I'm pretty knowledgeable about it. And just for the record, um, I'm all for most of it. I mean, we're going there anyway, so nobody cares if I'm for it or against it. But, you know, it, it, it is, a, you know, it, it's a part of the, the energy landscape and it's going to become more a part of it. That said, um, we're just going to have a heck of a time getting off of oil. Uh, as somebody recently said, uh, uh, oil is not just a hard act to follow, it's impossible. And, and, and that, I think, you know, really, really kind of summarizes the predicament, um, that our society is in. Uh, and, and it doesn't even matter if, if you think that climate change is or is not a problem. I mean, there are, uh, actually, in my view, far greater problems to face the globe than climate change. Um, you know, the, we just exceeded every kind of planetary boundary there is, and we're, you know, we're, we're not doing the ecosystem any good. And eventually that affects us humans and our prosperity. So we should care about it. Not a matter of being a tree hugger. It's a matter about caring about your wealth. So, um, anyway, bottom line is we are hugely dependent on oil and other fossil fuels and there's just an awful lot of things that we absolutely require to keep our civilization going that we just don't know how to make without fossil fuels right now so that that is the situation and therein lies the prediction okay and there's a chart here um that you've shown in the past um and it's a chart of uh, GDP, the relationship between GDP and basically um, energy consumption is measured in BTUs, and it's a ridiculously linear uh, relationship. Um, and so is it fairly fair to say that, um, you know, sort of as goes energy consumption, as goes the economy? Yeah, and and, and so the, the chart you're thinking about, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an instantaneous look. So for any given year, the correlation between energy consumption and GDP is 
got an R squared of something like 95. I mean, it's just ridiculous. It's, it's as close to a statistically perfect calculation as you can get. And, and it makes sense because the countries that have the biggest economies use the most energy to make stuff and ship stuff and, and buy stuff. And, and so it's, you know, energy, as I often say, energy is the economy. And, you know, we, we've discussed this before, but I mean, you know, a lot of people think that money is, is what the economy runs on. And of course it is the, 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 you know, the, the thing that we're most uh, comfortable with talking about, but I mean, money's really nothing but a claim on work and work is just energy, you know? So, I mean, money is really just uh, it's a proxy. It's a proxy for energy on some level or other. So um, energy is the economy. And, and as long as we're talking about ener uh, economic growth, we can't get there without energy growth. And, and so that, that, that's what the slide here, the, the chart you're thinking of uh, uh, talks about. And you know, we can discuss later that there are actually you know, some other components to that. I mean, there's, there's uh, GDP, there's uh, CO2 emissions, and there's population. And all four of those things lay down right on top of each other. And so you, know, you, it, it, you can't have one without the other three. And energy is primary, and the other three are secondary: GDP, CO2 emissions, and population. So, um, you know, the idea that we can uh, decrease CO2 emissions but continue using as much energy um, just defies what well, defies empirical fact. Can't do it. Um, you know, you want to, you know, you you, you want to degrow. You know, you want to somehow uh, decrease GDP. There's a bunch of people who think that's the solution to, you know, to our climate problems. Well, you know, okay, but you also got to say, well, that means that we have to do without the stuff you talked about, the stuff that we depend on every day that come from fossil fuels. And I'm not saying, you know, it's wrong. I'm just saying most people just don't understand how all this stuff complexly interrelates and what I'm trying to say is it does, and there are no, you know, simple solutions. It's like the, you know, the Jenga toy that my grandchildren play with. You know, you stack up a bunch of blocks and, and you start pulling pieces out, and whoever collapses the thing first loses. Well, you know, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to pull out CO2 emissions and somehow expect that the structure of our civilization isn't going to fall down. And 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 it will. <laughs> so you got to be careful about which piece you pull out next, or at least you have to be careful about understanding how does pulling that piece out affect other things that we don't want to lose. And then you have to decide: is this really where I want to go? And that's a whole other topic. But you know, my sense is that an awful lot of people who, you know, say they want climate change, if you told them they had to give up economic growth, they'd say, whoa, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> well, I'm here to tell you, you don't get one without the other. Uh, sorry, <laughs> at least that's, that's what the data tells me, and it's pretty darn clear. Okay, and, and we might, if there's time, we can sort of talk about the promise of new technologies or sure. new fuel sources or whatever. That that might change the game, but I know from many of our past discussions, Art, um, if we're trying to transition off of the current dependence that we have on oil, um, there isn't a clear bridge to a new energy future that doesn't require maybe having to make some really important sacrifices um, along the way uh, if, if we really are decreasing our, our oil consumption but but specifically around oil um now you know price sends a signal right um mm -hmm. and and usually uh, i mentioned in the introduction how the price of oil is has almost halved since june of last year and uh usually a price decline like that in oil is due to either uh lessening demand Mm -hmm. Right, which if you're in a recession, oftentimes you know oil prices go down in that, 
um, or it can be reflective of a, a big increase in supply. Um, where are, well, let me ask, sorry, let me ask that question more generally. Why has have oil prices declined as severely as they have over the past year? Well, let me count the ways, but uh, to keep it simple and in the framework that you've just described, it's because the world has just exactly the right amount of oil that it needs right now. And of course, you can pick up, you know, any any newspaper or particularly if you you know, weighed into something more financial, you know, like Bloomberg's or Wall Street Journal or whatever, uh, you'll find out in a hurry that there are all kinds of loud voices who are saying, no, no, no. You know, we've so badly underinvested in oil that, I mean, there's going to be this huge shortage just around the corner. And we are, you know, we're going to be hurting and oil's going to $100 or $120 or whatever. But what I'm saying, Adam, is that the market, with its price signal, is telling all of us, including those bullish analysts, uh, you know what? We're, we're pretty happy with where things are right now. Uh, we don't, we don't, or I don't, or whatever the heck the market is, you know, not really sharing your sense of urgency uh, about the future. And and so there's there's always guys that say, oh well, the market's wrong. And well, okay, you know, the market the market is what it is. But uh, markets just got a very different apparent opinion or perception than a lot of those guys do. So the simple answer is, when prices are lower than some people think they ought to be, it's probably because that's exactly where they want to be. Markets are cheap. Why should the market pay more? for a barrel of oil than it thinks it needs to. Markets are efficient. They're not always right. They are ruthlessly efficient. And market doesn't want to pay any more than it thinks it has to. It will if, if it thinks it needs to. But right now it's saying, no, don't think so. OK, um, so rewarding what you said, we're, we're kind of in the price sweet spot for oil right now, right? Where basically, use your words, the world, the world is sort of saying, hey, we, we, we've, we've got pretty much just what we need right now. We're, we're, we're good. Um, and, uh, you know, historically, uh, when oil has gotten far above $70 a barrel, it really starts constraining growth. Uh, and when it gets too far below $70 a barrel, producers start having problems producing it profitably, right? So this is sort of a, the Goldilocks range that we're in right now. Um, you have a chart that uh, you sent over before this conversation that that basically kind of indicates, and I'm using, I believe your words here, um, that we're, we're now sort of seeing investor flight from the oil markets. Um, yeah. Talk about that. And, and if you can, talk about what's causing it. Here, let me see if I can share my screen with you. Um, so what I'm showing here, this is simply uh, a representation of, uh, of a, a time series of the commitment of traders. This is, this is trader movement on uh, U.S. West Texas International crude oil. And, and, and what's being shown here um, in, in light yellow, that's just the price. Uh, and it's kind of shaded back because it's interesting, but it's not the main thing I want you to take a look at. And then we've got uh, two other curves. The red one, that is uh, open interest. That's how many oil contracts are out there that have not yet closed. And the other one is the light blue curve, and that are those are net long positions. So that's simply the, the difference between the long positions and the short positions. And what both of them show is that if we go up here to the upper left hand uh, part of the graph, we see, uh, you know, May, June 2018, things were kind of at a high, they were dropping down, COVID hit, and the open interest went way up because, you know, when oil negative $37 a barrel, it, it isn't going to go down anymore. Uh, but of course, net long positions reached the low too. So, you know, people were, you know, they were betting on the fact that, well, it's got to come back. Well, as soon as it came back, 
you know, we, we had this post-COVID rebound by June of 2021, and it's just been, you know, heading for the seller ever since. So, so this, this chart says two really important things, and that is, you know, think what you will or what you read, but uh, the people that actually put their money where their mouth is, the traders, uh, and this is, this is hedge funds mostly or managed money, so, you know, theoretically not so much speculative, but that's another discussion altogether. Uh, you know, people are, are, are generally shorter on oil than they are long, and they're not interested in holding many contracts. And so what this says or what it reflects to me is that, um, you know, oil was riding pretty high from the great financial crisis until the first part of this graph I talked about in mid-2018. People were throwing money at the oil market and everybody, not everybody, but an awful lot of people said, wait a minute, you know, you oil companies have been giving us lousy returns for a decade. You know, you suck. <laughs> we don't want <laughs> we don't want to put our money in you anymore. We're going somewhere else. And they did. And and so with a few, you know, anomalous uh resurgences, that's where we're at. What does this mean? It means that oil companies just don't have a lot of credit or capital available to them that they don't internally generate by cash flow. So they don't have that blank check of going to the markets either for for credit or you know selling secondary fair offerings, raising a couple of billion dollars in a morning and having enough to you know the drill baby drill for the next six months or twelve months or whatever. And this is a so this is a this is a paradigm shift. I mean this is something that the last time that we saw this for any length of time was you know, in, in the early 1980s. And of course, oil was depressed for 12 or 13 years after that. Uh, so this is kind of a big deal, at least it is to me. And if you don't understand this piece of it, then everything else that's going on in oil markets and with oil prices is, is, is confusing. And, and so that's, uh, that's not the only piece of this, but this is, this is, you know, like 101, if you want to understand, you can say the market's wrong, but the market has spoken very clearly, I believe, in, in, in this graphic. You know, we, we, we do have a lot of people that have been on this channel saying, uh, hey, we've underinvested in this sector for a long time. Um, and even if, economic growth sort of stays flat going forward. We're going to have shortages because we've underinvested in CapEx. Um, uh, there's been a lot of people on the show recently too saying that they think the oil sector's, you know, it was a darling last year. It's now kind of a dog so far at the beginning of this year. Um, you know, they're saying that oil prices are pretty attractive now at this point in terms of things like PE ratios and just, you know, historical fundamental valuations. Um, so kind of both of those narratives would say investors should be probably looking, you know, attractively at, at, at the, uh, the oil sector right now. Um, but it seems like you're looking at something that's more secular here, which is sort of, you know, an abandonment of the sector by a lot of the people that used to provide capital to it in the past. Um, I, I guess first question is, is, from your own perspective, um, <laughs> do you think these companies deserve more capital than they're getting right now? Like, like, like is this investor strike, for lack of a better word, uh, is it warranted? Is it the right thing to do? Or are we perhaps setting ourselves up for a higher probability of some of these, you know, production and supply shortages that, that people are worried about? Right. Uh, well, that you know, that's the million dollar question or maybe more. I, and, and the answer is, uh, I certainly understand both sides of the argument, Adam. Uh, but having said that, I, I think there's some, there's some uh, important elements that uh, perhaps some of the guests you've had on, on this channel 
don't fully understand. So, so when we say that there's underinvestment or, or lack of investment, uh, according to whom? Uh, certainly not according to the oil companies themselves. They have drastically scaled back their investments because that's what shareholders told them to do. Right. Okay. And oh, by the way, uh, cash flows from oil companies have never been higher in my in my career. Right. And, and sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just I just want you to address this in your answer. So what you're talking about right there is is sort of um, you know it's 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 a financial uh, preference, right? Where the, the the company has made decisions for financial reasons and. Um, I think part of the people that are concerned about the future are more just sort of the reality of like, hey, we're just not going out there and exploring and drilling as much as we were. And, and that regardless of what shareholders want in the future, there may come a period where we're just not getting enough out of the ground or at least at the price we want to fuel the economic growth we want. So sorry to interject, but I just wanted you to address that in your answer. No, I, I, I appreciate you, you adding that in. Uh, yeah, it's important. The, so, so let me just say a few things. First of all, um, the oil industry is not a service sector. You know, the oil industry um, hopefully provides or has provided for the needs of society uh, quite well over the many decades that I've been involved with it. But I mean, it's not like you know, it's not a philanthropic organization. I mean, uh, they've got shareholders that that they have to they have to satisfy so if there is under investment i mean whose fault is that i guess is the question and, and eventually it comes back to the the shareholders of the investors that have been sending this very strong message to to the oil companies but the second part of my answer though adam is what are your assumptions? And, and if your assumptions are, well, you know, we're not spending the amount of money or we don't have the number of rigs or, you know, fill in the blank. What I don't think some people understand, at least on the financial side, is that the, the per well efficiency of an awful lot of these oil plays or wells has increased tremendously just you know, like over the last two or three years. And so it simply takes fewer rigs and less capex to get the same amount of oil out of the ground. Now we saw this right after the big oil collapse, price collapse in 2014, 2015. We used to have, I can't remember in the United States, something like 1200 rigs, you know, oil directed rigs running all the time. And and that that number dropped down again. I can't remember to what it was. You know, something like half. Everybody was saying, "Oh my gosh, you know, we're screwed now." I mean, look what's going to happen. Except that we weren't, because what most of those rigs that were what we call stacked um, were old-fashioned rigs. You know, they they didn't have the you know, the, the high power diesel engines, the top drives, they weren't capable of drilling the horizontal wells and all that kind of stuff. And so the reality was is that we got rid of a whole lot of rigs, we spent a whole lot less money, but we actually produced more oil. And what I'm telling you is, is that to my surprise, I have to say, uh, you know, back in 2020, 21, uh, I was fully expecting we we're going to see a big drop in U.S. production because I couldn't imagine that we're going to see another paradigm shift like 2014-15, but we did. And whether that's sustainable is another question. You know, is that just accelerate rate, you know, acceleration of rate, or is that actually finding new reserves? And we don't really want to get into that right now. But but what I guess I'm saying is, is that this scary thing that everybody sees looming right around the corner uh, has not appeared and does not seem to worry the market that pays a lot more attention than some people think to at least medium-term supply. 
All right, that's that's a fascinating topic, um, particularly because over the years, Art, you and I have sort of addressed concerns about peak oil and whatnot. Um, but it sounds like you're saying that the technology has has really been changing the game, even in even in just recent years too, uh, to make uh, oil extraction a lot more efficient and presumably, you know, uh, higher output, lower cost. Um, and I, I just read a report of yours that was talking specifically about the Permian Basin. And, and for those viewers who aren't super up to speed in the oil industry, this is one of the U.S.'s big shale oil plays. And um, again, Art, you, you and I have talked in past years about how shale oil fields deplete much more quickly than conventional oil fields. Um, and the belief for a long time was, um, yeah, these fields are gonna they're gonna they're gonna yield uh, a lot of oil in the short term, but they're all gonna just deplete very quickly after that. And I, somebody, it might even been yourself, um, <laughs> said that uh, America's shale oil revolution is basically like the the big retirement party for the oil industry, right? But your report that I just read today, if I read it correctly, basically says. The Permian output is remaining surprisingly resilient and is probably going to be, at least at sort of looking at current trajectories, probably going to be much more uh, abundant for much longer than most people initially were expecting out of this play. Did I read that report right? Yeah, you did. And 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 here's the you know, here here's the subtext. Uh that's based on the geology. Okay. So uh, the Permian geology, and 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 for your you know your your audience who is not a hundred percent you know up to date on all this. I mean, the Permian Basin has provided pretty much all of the oil growth in the world for the last four or five years. All right, so it's massively it's important. <laughs> it's hugely important. It's it's you know it's critical for growth. And and the other shale plays, um, you know, the Eagle Ford, the Bakken, et cetera. I mean, you know, they're hardly going out of business, but they're not growing anymore, which is pretty much, you know, what I what I anticipated. And so when I said a retirement party, I mean, just because somebody retires doesn't mean that they, you know, go off and you know turn into a vegetable and die a few years later. I mean, you could have, you know, a long active retirement. And, and so it, it it always was. I mean, I I, I said that because uh, yeah, it, it was kind of cute, you know. It caught people's attention. They remember it, and you know, what the heck. But and it is true. But but the 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 reality is is that we've got we. I mean, the the public has this funny idea about depletion. You know, they think that. Uh, you know, depletion is a real problem, and 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 maybe you know maybe it had to do a little bit with the peak oil uh, vibe or or literature back in you know in the early 2000s. But but the truth is that depletion is actually not yet a big problem. It it, it will be, believe me. Peak oil will come. I promise. You. And I'm not invested in, I mean, and I'm talk, not talking financially here, but, you know, I, I don't really care if it comes or not. I just know that it's a fundamentally sound idea. We have, we live on a finite planet, you know, we're not making any more oil <laughs> and we're using a heck of a lot of it. But, you know, I mean, and, and, and I've got, you know, I've got a slide here. I'll, I'll be glad to show you, but this is the United States and it begins 50 years ago in 1981, and the blue are proved reserves. And the orange at the bottom is production. Okay, so if you want to think about it uh, the right way, depletion is reserves minus production. Okay, and so if you're worried about depletion without having to do the arithmetic, the the production wedge at the bottom is a real tiny little thing compared to the uh, the reserved wedge in blue on top of it, isn't it? 
And if you just divide the two, if you divide reserves by production rate, you end up with this black thing, which are the years of supply. How much do we have divided by how much are we using every year? And what you find out is that in 2021 or 2022, whatever the last date on this graph was, we had just about exactly 11 years of supply. And somebody might say, well, geez, that's not very much. Uh, I hope I'm alive more than 11 years, and so do I, by the way. But the reality is that that 11 years has been the average years of supply for the United States for the last 50 years. Why is that? Because you don't want to overdrill. You don't want to spend too much money, money finding something that you don't need. So you get the price signal and that spurs more drilling and that means more reserves. And so we look at, at what happens, you know, the peak oil period is kind of right here in the middle. We get to 2008, the great financial crisis, oil price jumps up to $100 a barrel in money of the day. It stayed there for like four years. Guess what? People did a lot of drilling and we added a heck of a lot of reserves. Most of that was shale. So as long as you're finding more than you're producing, this ratio, this you know, reserves divided by production, the years of supply, pretty much stays the same. And 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 again, don't don't misunderstand me. I, I'm not being a cornucopian here. I'm I'm not saying that because it's been that way for 50 years means that it's always going to be that way. Of course it won't. And at what price is another question. Uh, clearly, it took some pretty high prices to, to kick this thing into gear after the great financial crisis. But nonetheless, I mean, I think that people people confuse depletion with decline. So a well declines or a modern well declines really fast. That doesn't mean that, that it's depleting or that doesn't mean the field is depleting. So, you know, it, it's important to kind of you know, every once in a while, get calibrated with someone who actually knows the, the, the you know, the truth on the ground and say, well, you know, um, I, some of these concerns, they're real and I take them seriously, but they're, they're you know, it's not a problem yet. That, that, that's all I can say. Okay. Get us back and, our, um, sorry, bring that chart back up again for a sec. Yeah, sure. So is it is it safe to say that the 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 dramatic rise in blue supply after mm -hmm. the, the great financial crisis was really tapping into the shale fields? Mostly, yeah. Okay. Um, um, now a lot of it was uh, putting the deep water Gulf of Mexico on production, which I mean that 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 period of exploration lagged way back into the into the 1990s, but, you know, clearly, well, clearly to me, maybe not so much to our audience, but I mean, those are just phenomenally expensive wells and production platforms, you know, or a billion, two billion dollars, and you got to lay pipelines at door. I mean, it's a big, a big investment. So it takes a long time to get from exploration to discovery to first oil. And so, you know, a piece certainly of this big wedge was offshore Gulf of Mexico, but shale would be, I, I'd say it's probably, you know, 70%. Okay, so mostly shale, uh, but some like the, the Gulf of Mexico, and that's kind of where I was going with this question was, did, did the reserves that are shown here, are those, is that all the oil we know of, or is that sort of reasonably economically uh, extractable reserves? Um, are, okay, so a reserve, is discovered oil at a price. Okay, so in order to book a reserve in the United States with the Securities and Exchange Commission, you have to have proved that that means it's not something you think is there. You've drilled it, or you've drilled something close enough that you could demonstrate that, you know, a, a very high probability that it, it's there and it's commercial at whatever the, the SEC price was for the year it was booked. So an awful lot of these reserves were booked at 
you know, $60 a barrel, $50 a barrel, $40 a barrel. Now, when for the for the you know, the odd years where they were booked at $90 a barrel, when the SEC price goes down the next year, the company has to take a write down. Okay? They have to say, well, we're you know, we're not going to take those proved reserves off the book, but we're going to take a, you know, we're going to take a, a financial hit on our, our quarterly earnings because that, you know, those reserves just stop being commercial for us. So in the U.S., I mean, it's not a perfect system. Don't get me wrong, but we've got a, uh, you know, a much more uh, rigorous way of, of uh, monitoring just how real these reserves are than, you know, let's say Saudi Arabia, which has zero and many countries in between. So that's part of the reason that I often rely on U.S. centric data. It's not because I ignore the rest of the world. It's just that U.S. data is, is for whatever reason, uh, it, it, it's awfully good and it's awfully current. I mean, when you want to know something about European production or European consumption, you're lucky to get a monthly piece of data that's worth anything, whereas with the U.S., you get it all weekly. Okay. Much well, more frequency. What, when, what I was going with that here is, and I think you're corroborating this, but, but please clarify, is uh, the reserves we're looking at here are, are relatively economically recoverable uh, oil reserves you know, at or around the current price. Right? No, they so, are. They absolutely are. They absolutely are. So my point here is, is and, and let me add that not to interrupt. Well, I will interrupt <laughs> at a ten percent return. Oh wow! Okay. Okay. So these so they, are, have, they have to be economically attractive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So where I'm going with this is, as should the price of oil march higher from here, mm -hmm. we may then have additional reserve fields come on into the picture here, growing the the reserve volume here because all of a sudden a play that's not economical or can't give a 10 percent return at 70 dollar oil well maybe can at 90 dollar a barrel oil right there you go no exactly right so there are proved reserves i mean they're proved that they exist but they're not proved that they can be produced commercially at a 10 percent return so they don't make they don't make this this tally okay all right so um you know, the reason why I'm kind of sticking on this is uh, if what I hear you saying, Art, is there are people that that have some very big concerns about resource depletion in general, but oil being a critical one for all the reasons we talked about mm -hmm. at the beginning of this interview. Mm -hmm. um, and I hear you saying, um, hey, in, in the long scope, yes, um, we probably will have peak oil related issues. But it, it does not seem to be a an immediate or near term concern of yours. And uh, don't let me put those words in your mouth. But one of the reasons why I'm bringing this up too is you and I have spoken for years before I started Wealthy on, and you know I was working with people that wrote about the peak oil concern. So I don't want to say that you're unringing the bell, but I maybe what you're doing is you're 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 turning down the volume with which you're ringing it, saying yes, it's going to be a a, a big problem at some future decade, but probably not going to be in the driver's seat much, at least in the next couple of years. Fair way to put it. I, I would say, okay, so now we're, we're, there, there's two, there's two separate things we have to talk about, geologically and financially. Geologically, we're in 2023. Geologically, I would say that sometime in the next decade, we should start to see uh, a decline in world, well, we've already seen a decline in world production, but it's, uh, we, we should start to see, you know, what people would call peak oil begin in earnest. Now, the it's not going to be a collapse, okay? <laughs> it's, it's a long, slow, uh, you know, slide downward. But if, if all we were talking about, you got plenty of money, and it's just geology. I mean, what I told you before is most of the U.S. shale plays are just on maintenance right now. 
They're, they're not declining, but they're not growing. It's just the Permian that's holding everything up. All right. And even though I did say, and you correctly interpreted my report to say, you know, there's plenty of locations left to drill in the Permian, more than plenty. There's a lot. Um, but it takes a lot to keep the production level up. So I'm saying in the short term, in the next couple of years, I agree with you completely. You know, get out towards the end of the 2020s. Um, uh, I'm starting to get a little bit more concerned. You know, I might come back and, you know, revise what I'm saying then. The other thing I want to say, and I say this with, with the greatest of respect, uh, is that so many of the people involved in the peak oil movement, if that's the right word, had absolutely no experience in earth science. I mean, they were smart people. I, you know, I, I knew a lot of them. I, mean, I was involved in that, okay? But very few of them actually understood or could make the kind of charts that I'm showing you right now. You know, I mean, the, the whole Matt Simmons kind of uh, twilight in the desert thing. I mean, if, if you go back and look at I mean, and he was, you know, really the most eloquent spokesman, I think, for peak oil. Um, but, you know, his hypothesis was, well, what if Saudi reserves aren't as big as they say they are? I and mean, we got no way to know. Right. And if they're not, whoops, then we're in big trouble. <laughs> and And he was not wrong to say that. but. <laughs> You know, we've subsequently got an audit of Saudi reserves that was put out in 2019 when they wanted to IPO a piece of Saudi Aramco. And a very reputable reserve auditor, Nederland and Sewell, um, I think it was Nederland and Sewell, it might not have been, I'll take that back, but somebody like them said, well, you know, basically what they said is pretty much the case. So, you know, that hypothesis sort of went out the window. Uh, and, and there's still many that question it. And there's always people that say, well, you know, reserve audits are corrupt and OK, whatever. But um, my point, my point is, is that uh, th there were there were a lot of well-meaning, very smart people who were speculating about things that they really had very little personal experience in doing. And if you go back to the beginning, uh, you know, not so much M. King Hubbard as, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Campbell and La Herrera. I mean, those are the guys who wrote the, the 1994 or five Scientific American article that was titled The End of Cheap Oil. So their whole concept of cheap oil wasn't that we're running out of it. It's that we're running out of cheap oil. And they were 100% right about that. And if only, you know, all of these other guys who were so vocal in the peak oil movement had stuck to the, you know, the right playbook and didn't get all spun off on trying to say, well, is, is the peak going to be in 2007 or 2011? You know, they, they, got, they, they got distracted, as humans often do. I often do. But the bottom line is that you know, if, if you look at the price of oil in 1995 or in 2000 or 2005 and, and compare it to the price of oil today, particularly in real dollars, there's no question that oil is hugely more expensive today. That was true. The end of cheap oil. And that's an issue. But before I completely lose the thread, the <laughs> geology is one thing. But what if there's no no credit, no capital, or not enough to grow production. I think that's more of a concern based on the first chart I showed you. And therefore, we may have plenty of oil left in the ground and just not the, the appetite, the financial appetite, to, to go drill it and get it out until, until perhaps there, there, there is some kind of crisis. Okay. And, and that, that's, that's good from a peak oil standpoint, meaning we're mm -hmm. leaving more in the ground longer. Um, but it's probably bad for a society standpoint where we want to grow and we can't because we're not able to get enough, at least economically, uh, out to fund the growth that we want. Right. And I guess that's I'm, I'm going to revisit that earlier question I asked one more time. 
which is a how much of a concern is it for you that we may be creating that event with today's approach um where you know historically or, or recently these companies are exploring less and, and just returning uh their high cash flows in the form of dividends to shareholders um and i'm going to couple that with my understanding of the tension between the oil industry and the current administration here in the US that's basically telling them um we don't want you around in the future <laughs> and therefore there's a real disincentive to make big capital investments because you're just not sure you're going to be allowed to enjoy the the returns on them <laughs> because the government is basically giving you signs we don't we don't want your industry to be in business still yeah, well, uh, fair point. I, I I I take the second part of that with uh, several teaspoons or tablespoons or truckloads of salt, because to my and, and this is a completely apolitical comment, by the way. Um, but and, and, and my question was intended to be apolitical I, too. It's just what I. A hear. lot of people will take it differently. You know? But the, I mean, the, the the truth is, is that. This administration or any other administration is unable to to stop oil companies from drilling, except say on federal land. I mean, if you own a lease somewhere in New Mexico or Texas in the Permian Basin, and you've got a, a lease agreement with whoever the mineral owner is, I mean, the federal government does not have any authority to come in and say, well, you can't drill here unless they are the mineral owner, unless your contract is with them. Right. They can oh, throw oh, regulations in front of you and, you know, they can take away certain tax credits and, you know. Or, or, can, or impose taxes, too. Or <laughs> impo they, they can do all kinds of stuff, okay? But, and, 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 and the oil companies, the industry will green bloody murder about that but you know i mean i've been in this industry for more than 40 years and when things are good this industry makes a lot of money and it's making a lot of money right now so um that doesn't mean that they, that, that that makes up for the bad times but I, i'm a little bit I, i'm i'm more skeptical about what the u.s government can do versus what the great momentum of of government and policy makers around the world which in some way reflects their constituency I, i'm more worried about that momentum because when you get right down to it uh you know for those who you know who pound the table about you know darn it we we, we just gotta stay on fossil fuels i mean you know this, this renewable stuff is nuts you know, for one reason or another. Well, you know, I don't want to argue the, the the pros and cons of that, but on some level, it kind of doesn't matter. I mean, that train left the station, guys. I mean, you know, the I mean, the world, the government leaders of the world are preparing for a much more renewable world, like it or not, whether it's right or wrong, I can't say. But that's where we're going. I mean, you ask the average person in the United States, whether they think climate change is a problem, and something like 65% will say, yeah, I think it's a problem. Now, is it as big a problem for them as the economy? No. But do they think that it's right for the government to be doing things to protect the climate? They absolutely do. So, I mean, that's, that, and, 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 and that's a whole nother, whole nother discussion. Is that right? And and I think you know uh, from you know the post that I put out today that I mean I think net zero is you know the, is is an absolute pipe dream. I think it's nuts. I mean it's it, it's just uh, it doesn't mean that its intention is is is, is nuts, uh, but you know it, it it's just it's absolutely it, it's a fantasy. It's an absolute fantasy. So let, let me let me jump in here, um, and and I know we're treading into sensitive territory where we probably will inflame certain 
viewers yeah. on one side of the spectrum or the other. Um, and so we'll try to navigate this as, as uh, you know, uh, diplomatically and as um, impartially as we can. Um, and we don't have a ton of time left either. So this is a tall order in the, in the last couple of minutes we got going on here. But um, uh, I, I think you said it well, where, where we, can, we can separate the intention from the approach right or you know for, for, from the path that's being charted i i think most people around the world would say look if we could if we can make energy in a more environmentally uh or in a less environmentally impactful way um hey we should do that right i mean who's who, who, who wouldn't want to do that right i don't think there are many people who are on the pro environmental destruction for its own sake train right mm -hmm. um so then you just have to ask yourself, okay, you know, well, well, how how wise once we've identified the mission, how wise are we creating the process for pursuing it? And uh, you know, I, I, nothing's perfect in the world, but but we can certainly point to elements where it has been handled quite inelegantly. Um, I'm going to mention Germany as an example of this, mm -hmm. right? Where you know they. They, they really advanced their transition, probably, you know, got ahead of their skis. And as a result, they had ended up burning more coal, you know, in the past year and a half than, than I think they'd burned in any equivalent period in their history, right? Um, so, so there's one thing which is like, are we just coming up with sort of unrealistic um, paths here? And it sounds like you think net zero isn't being pursued uh, in an intelligent way. Um, the other thing I want to tack onto this before I let you respond is, you know, this happens almost in any kind of real movement where a lot of money goes into the way that money's been going into green energy and ESG and all that stuff right now, where mm -hmm. what happens is, is people uh, who, who benefit from those flows of money, <laughs> they end up kind of running the movement uh for their advantage, because there's just so much darn money for them to be to be made. I'm, let me make a, an, an inelegant equivalent here. Um, Michael Schoenberger's work in the, the with the homeless situation in San Francisco, out in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, where I live. You know, he's really said that th there are a lot of people uh, in positions of power um, who are running a lot of sort of these these you know homeless advocacy groups or you know they're they're involved in making policy partnering with the state to come up with policy to deal with homelessness and he said basically a lot of them aren't incented to solve the homeless problem mm -hmm. uh, because they make so much money from the homeless problem that and oftentimes they thwart a lot of what might be actually pretty good proposals that could make a difference because it's become this self-fulfilling uh you know, money geyser for them, right? So you 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 get this perversion, I guess is what I'm saying, uh, where you know a lot of people actually get incented to not solve the problem. So I'm just curious. Um, I guess I'll just let you respond to that word salad. I, I I just spewed there, but but it seems like you know we can have a really good mission, but we can have a problem of both strategy and human talent that keep us from executing on that mission well. Right. So let me just try to drill right into the center of that problem. And my opinion, my studied view, is that most people in the world, through no fault of their own, and this includes world leaders, are energy blind. They have absolutely no idea about how energy works, where it comes from where it goes, what can be done with it. And again, that's not a, that's not a criticism. It's, just a, it's an empirical observation. And so um, the situation is as follows for the enlightenment of our audience. Renewable energy, including nuclear, including you know, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, everything, is good for one thing only, and that's to generate electric power. Electric power accounts for less than 20% of total energy consumption in the world today. Okay, so 
we can do all the wonderful and noble and cool things we want with renewable energy of all flavors, and we have not yet attacked the 80% elephant in the room, the rest of all the energy we need. And somebody will say, but wait a minute, electric vehicles will take a huge proportion of transport fuel off the table, right? So you're wrong, Art. You know, you're missing a really, well, so the first question is, you know, how long is that going to take? And you can look at all kinds of figures about, you know, what percent of new car sales are EVs. And it's an impressive number. But the bottom line truth is, is that in the United States, the number of EVs out there are something like one and a half percent of all vehicles in the United States. And so we're not going to get to enough EVs, no matter how impressive the new car sales are, to take very much gasoline and diesel off the market in decades, is my guess. In the most aggressive and, and if you're in favor of that, optimistic case. That's just the way human beings work. You know, I've got a perfectly good gasoline or diesel powered car that I bought three years ago. It'll probably last 15 or 20 years. I'll be damned if I'm just going to throw it on the junk heap so I can get an expensive EV. That's piece number one. The other piece is this idea of clean energy. It's an absolutely ridiculous idea. Okay? It's just ridiculous. And I say that not to disparage the people who use the phrase. It's like my shale is a retirement party. It's a good phrase. You know, it gets people attention. All energy is lily white, squeaky clean until you use it. There is no such thing as clean or dirty energy. It's all clean. When you convert it into work, it creates two byproducts. One is emissions and the other is heat. Every form of energy does it. There's no exception. This is physics, okay? This is the law. These are the laws of thermodynamics, okay? And so if society is going to continue to consume energy, let's say at the same or nearly the same level that we are right now, it really doesn't matter what your sources of energy input are. You're going to produce waste and heat as part of that process. And by the way, CO2 is nothing more than waste. Okay? It's tailpipe. <laughs> for the whole human enterprise, all right? It's one of many. And so you just can't get there from here. You can't keep consuming what we're consuming in terms of end use with any kind of renewable, non-renewable, clean, dirty technology without producing pretty much the same amount of waste and heat that you are right now. And that's because you're EV or your solar panel or, you know, your wind turbine, you have a whole supply chain and life cycle of work involved. I mean, you got to extract the minerals from the ground. You've got to put them on a boat and send it somewhere, manufacture it into something. You got to send it on a boat somewhere else. It gets picked up on a truck. It gets taken to Amazon's warehouse. It comes to you. And, and there are Four things that society, civilization cannot stand, stand up without. Steel, cement, plastic, and fertilizer. All four, we, we have no idea how to make any of those four without fossil fuels. So people say, I saw recently, the city of Amsterdam recently said, no more fossil fuels by 2030. Okay, great, guys. Now, um, did you include in that statement that there will be no more steel, no more cement, no more plastic, and no more fertilizer, which means there'll be no construction, there'll be no computers, there'll be no hospitals and healthcare, which are one of the principal consumers of plastic, and there won't be any fertilizer in the countryside to produce food. Well, no, we didn't say that. Well, that's what you mean, isn't it? Now, again, I'm not, I'm not disparaging the, you know, the, 
you know, the good people of Amsterdam. I'm saying they're energy blind. They don't get it. They don't understand that this is a complex web. You can't take out one piece of the Jenga puzzle without eventually it's going to fall down. We do not know how to smelt steel out of iron ore in any, at any kind of scale without coal. Dirty, stinking coal. We just don't know how to do it. And I don't know when we ever will. And by the way, nuclear fusion will not solve the problem. We'll leave it there. Um, but, you know, we, we, we as human beings, you know, just think there must be some box of hope somewhere. Somebody's going to figure it out. There's some technology. I'm here to tell you, I share your hopefulness, but it ain't going to happen not going to happen in my lifetime. It's not going to happen in your lifetime. If we believe that there is a predicament with the ecosystem and climate change, then we don't have the time it takes to figure those things out. And so we cannot, our society will collapse without steel, cement, plastic, and fertilizer. And so if you want to pull out that piece, you want to pull out that Jenga piece of fossil fuel, go ahead and do it. You're going to lose the game. I'm not advocating that, you know, we go the other direction and go berserk on fossil fuels. I'm just trying to describe the problem. It's a big problem. It's a big problem. And what's interesting to me about this conversation, Art, is we've talked for, like I said, you know, many, many years. Yeah. And I, I feel like I've gotten from this conversation that you're actually a little le less worried in the short term and maybe a little more worried in the long term. <laughs> you have absolutely nailed it, Adam. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm real worried in the long term. I'm real worried in the medium term. In the short term, I'm a whole lot more worried about a collapse of the financial system and nuclear war than I am any of the things that we're talking about right now. I mean, yeah. you know, those things could put everything into, you know, uh, an absolute tailspin, you know, any time between next week and the next couple of years. Now, you know, I hope that's not the case. But realistically, I mean, those are those are real risks that are out there. And you certainly know about them as well as I do. Yeah, so. uh <laughs> Hopefully, uh, those crises don't arise, or at least, hopefully, definitely, the the nuclear one doesn't arise. Right. Um, but they're non they're not dismissible by any stretch, and uh, and and they do merit our our full attention. Um, but but almost kind of like um, you know, whenever I talk to Lacey Hunt on the economic side, he says, "Look, the Fed has to kill the inflation dragon that is its immediate foe. It's got to vanquish." But don't forget, the second it does kill that dragon, it's then going to turn around and start attacking the much bigger deflation dragon <laughs> that uh, it was fighting before and had to put its sword down to kill the inflation. So in other words, we had this, this multiple nested set of, of, you know, crises, many of them existential. And, you know, I think one we're talking about here, it's, it's largely an existential crisis, certainly at least for our way of life. Um, again, not on tomorrow's doorstep, but but you know, in a decade or so, yeah, may, maybe actually it starts really getting real. He also doesn't sound doesn't sound like you've got a ton of hope that we've got like the brain trust on the problem here, as you categorize most of the politicians that are driving regulation around this right now or initiatives around this right now as being energy blind. Um, so that's not super confidence inspiring. So I'm going to have to wrap it up here, Art. But but maybe this is such a big and important question, and I know that there are going to be many viewers here who each had their individual questions that have been raised by the last sort of 15 minutes of discussion here uh, that are going to be frustrated that we're closing things off here. So I'd love it if at some point you might be open to coming on and doing a live session with me where I can largely be just fielding questions from the audience um, around this energy transition topic that we've been talking about. Is that something you'd be open to? I'd love to do it, Adam. And let me just say for the benefit of, you know, those people that are freaking out on the other side of this conversation, you know, I'm not, I'm not depressed. I, I'm not pessimistic. I'm not bummed out. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I mean, I'm a scientist. Yeah. My, my, 
my job is to describe the current situation. That doesn't mean that it's going to, you know, it's going to make me uh, you know, want to go kill myself or anything. I mean, I think life is pretty darn good. And I think it will be, you know, it'll be surprisingly good for those that are psychologically prepared for some kind of change. And, and, and we're going to, I mean, what I'm saying is, is there will be an adjustment in in our standards of living over some period in the future hopefully it'll be slower than it will be longer um but you know that doesn't uh, understanding what what's in front of me doesn't depress me it's getting surprised by something that i didn't expect that really bums me out so uh you know i i don't want people to take from what I'm saying, oh my God, you know, I don't have to give up. No, I, w- what I like to do is learn more and understand better. But I can tell you that the path that we are on is, it, it, everybody's just so darn focused on one thing. You know, we got to solve this emission problem. Well, you know, we're just going to push the problem somewhere else. That's, that, 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 that may be what a politician has to do. But that's not going to work. That's that's all I'm saying. So uh, hopefully, some people that are listening will endeavor to be to become a little bit less energy blind, so that they can they can understand where I'm coming from and maybe feel a little better about things. All right, great. Well, I appreciate that that intent to calm folks a little bit to say, hey, look, you're not putting your head in the oven after this conversation. No. Um, Although just to reiterate your point there about you know what we're doing as a society right now, it seems like we're we're real intent on solving the less than twenty percent part of our energy consumption, <laughs> which hey maybe that's something we should do, but we should also be really dedicating a lot of energy to the eighty percent part of the challenge as well, which you're saying we're, we're we're maybe not looking at nearly as closely. So very unfairly, before I get to my last question, can you just give us? 60 second, two minute short answer on where, if anywhere, do you see the opportunity right now? Um, and, and again, we, we have investors and, and mostly people who are, you know, they're, they're, they're not crazy speculators who are going to be investing in like wildcatting, but, um, you know, are, are, are looking for, you know, opportunities to invest at least a prudent portion of their portfolio um, in things that make sense. Are there particular sectors or, or types of companies right now or, or certain energy related commodities uh, that you're sanguine on? Sure. Well, let's just talk quickly about oil. Um, well-managed oil companies are, um, you know, they are good investments or should be good investments in times of high prices, low prices, ESG, whatever. And, um, you know, I, I, with, I don't want to of course, particular names, but, uh, you know, certain major, well, I'll, I'll just, I mean, certain companies like Chevron, like, you know, like Exxon, like, like Oxy that have, you know, really well-managed portfolios, uh, mostly around the world, but also in the Permian Basin where growth is, um, you know, those, those have been consistent for, well, Exxon's been up and down a little bit, but you know, it was a few years ago. But I mean, those are always, I think, very sound investments. The other thing is, is that we're we're going to see consolidation, you know, mergers and acquisitions. And so, uh, you know, there's there's been a persistent rumor that, you know, Exxon or Chevron or somebody's going to buy Pioneer Natural Resources, which, by the way, is also a very strong company. Uh, but, you know, if you if you look carefully at who are the strong, smaller companies, somewhat smaller companies that are likely to get acquired. I mean, you can make a ton of money. <laughs> you may lose money on whoever buys them, at least in the short term, but you make a ton of money on whoever whoever gets bought. You know, the Canadian oil companies are, I mean, they've had to labor under, you know, much more difficult uh, fiscal structure and price structure than the U.S. And there are companies up there that, you know, just consistently deliver strong returns. Now on the the alternative energy side, all you really need to do, you know, don't get beguiled by all the techno BS. Okay. Just just look at where the money's going. You know, look at where the US government, you know, the uh, you know, the, the this latest bit of legislation, this, you know, 
huge windfall for all these renewable companies. I mean, that is that's just money in the bank, at least in the short term. Just find out, you know, where the I mean, there was an article on the, you know, in in uh, in, in Wall Street was Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Journal uh, Monday talking about uh, Digar Shah, who personally runs four hundred billion dollars worth of government money in a couple of his companies. You know, I mean, it, it's just going to be really hard. And I don't know a thing about those companies. So, I'm, you know, and I'm never given financial advice because that's not my job. But, you know, I mean, follow the money. The government is guaranteeing that those companies are going to make money. That, that, that's just like it or not, you know, right or wrong. That's what's happening. So, I mean, I, and I, think, as, I think as people get less energy blind, a lot of what I'm saying is going to start to change. And if you're ahead of that game, you're going to make some money. And I'm curious on that part, um, we, we started this conversation with sort of the investor strike going on in the mm -hmm. oil markets. As people become less energy blind, do you see more capital than flowing back into the fossil fuel space? A different class of investors. I don't expect very many of those who left in 2018 to come back. I may be wrong. But there will be a new class of investor that recognizes what perhaps they didn't or don't. Somebody's going to move into the space, okay? And 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 the space is not vacant <laughs> by any means. It just doesn't have the same access to to capital and credit that it did several years ago. Okay, but but and again, don't let me put words in your mouth. As you see the the world waking back up to the essentiality of fossil fuels and the difficulties in moving off of them in any speedy way, given that they are responsible for the vast majority of the energy consumption mix, capital that otherwise maybe today is saying, well, that's not green, I don't want to be there, it may say, all right, you know what, that stuff's going to need to be around, it's going to give off good returns for the long haul, I'm going to put some more capital to work in that space. Exactly right. That's my all right. Um, all right. Well, as always, Art, I hate to wrap these up because you and I can and have many times talked for hours. Um, for folks that have enjoyed this conversation and would like to follow you and your work from here, where should they go? If you go to artberman.com, uh, everything on my website today is free. Um, I have ended all my subscription services because they're too much of a pain in the neck to manage. Uh, so everything new that goes out there, just about everything new for six months has been free. Go to artberman.com. If you want uh, a more, uh, you know, moment-by-moment uh, -moment brain dump, uh, at AEBerman12 on Twitter. I'm on LinkedIn as well. Uh, those are places where you can find me and uh, you know, you can interact with me or you can send me a note on my website, but that's, that's where I am. And, uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm not in this for the money. Uh, I'm, I'm in this because I love doing it. And, uh, for people that want to know more, maybe, maybe they'll say, oh, you know, you're full of it, man. We don't like what you're saying, <laughs> but you know, if, if, if you, if, if you think what I have to offer is, is useful, uh, it, it, it's out there and, and it's free. All right. Well, um, I think folks should be able to know by now, but I absolutely think it's incredibly useful. I think the fact that you're now just giving it to the world um, sans subscription is a true gift. And uh, I love your mission art, how I interpret it is just trying to make the world a little less energy blind. Um, wow. So super appreciative that, that you are out there doing that. Um, uh, so anyways, Art, um, if, if folks, if there's enough interest, like I said, in a, in a doing a live event with Art, if you're interested in that, let me know in the comments section below. If indeed there is enough interest, Art will reach back out to you and hopefully we'll be able to schedule one of those relatively soon. Um, all right, folks, uh, if you want to take advantage of, of, you know, applying some of the insights that Art shared here in terms of putting that to work in your investment portfolio, as always, highly recommend you do that. Uh, under the experience of a professional financial advisor in general, but specifically one that takes into account all of the issues that Art has talked with us about here. Um, to be honest, there aren't that many that really understand all that. Um, but uh, if you've got a good one who's doing that for you, great. You should really stick with them. If you don't, though, or if you'd like a second opinion from one who does, 
uh, feel free to talk to uh, one of the financial advisors that Wealthion endorses and just set up a free consultation with them. To do that, uh, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there. These consultations, totally free. They don't cost you anything. There's no commitment to work with these guys, just a public service uh, they offer to help people prudently position and hopefully in advance for some of the things that Art talked about here. Um, and if you'd uh, like to see Art come back on this channel again soon, whether it's in the live format or just coming back on when he lets me know he's got something important he wants to share, um, please do me a favor and voice your support for that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Art, can't thank you enough. Thanks so much for joining us today and giving us so much of your time and expertise. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Adam. Thanks for having me back. All right. Thanks so much, Art. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.